Good afternoon. I'm Jack Hurley, Senior Vice President of Broadcasting and Deputy Director of the Museum. Welcome to the night studio at the museum. The museum is pleased to partner with NASA to present today's panel discussion commemorating the 40th anniversary of the Apollo 8 mission. The story of Apollo 8 captured the nation's attention in December 1968 when crew members Frank Borman, James Lovell, and William Anders became the first men to circle the moon and to leave their indelible mark on history. During their epic voyage, the crew's Christmas Eve reading from the book of Genesis was carried live on the networks. At the time, the broadcast was the most watched program in television history. Today, we are pleased to have the Apollo 8 crew with us here in the studio as we take a look back at that extraordinary moment and recognize the heroic efforts of the crew Time Magazine named 1968's Men of the Year. I'd also like to mention that this event coincides with the unveiling of the museum's new documentary film, NASA at 50, which is playing continuously in the Robert H. and Clarice Smith Big Screen Theater on Level 5. Before you leave the museum today, I encourage you to stop by and take a look at this must-see film. It'll take you back in time. While putting this program together, we enjoyed working with several members of the NASA staff. I'd like to personally acknowledge Bert Ulrich, Bob Jacobs, Michael Green, Paul Ehlers, Jacob Keaton, and Doc Merrillson, and all the dedicated NASA employees who are here today. I'd also like to thank our Press Pass members for joining us for this special program. The Freedom Forum and Museum have enjoyed a terrific relationship with NASA. Admiral Alan Shepard served as one of our trustees for many years. In 1961, Shepard piloted Freedom 7 during Project Mercury and became the first American in space. Ten years later, on Apollo 14, he walked in the moon. We salute Admiral Shepard and all of the NASA team members. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce our moderator, Nick Clooney. Nick is the museum's distinguished journalist in residence, whose career in news spans more than 50 years, sort of like NASA. Nick has hosted national TV shows for ABC and the American Movie Classics Network and authored three books and written a long-time column for the Cincinnati Post. Nick also lent his voice to the NASA documentary playing in the big screen theater. Please join me in welcoming Nick Clooney. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Jack. Thank you. NASA has aged a lot better than I, may I say. Welcome to this special edition of Inside Media from the museum's night television studio. It was 1962 that President John Kennedy challenged the country to go to the moon before the end of the decade. And the space race was on. And now we're going to show you a very short, this is just about three minutes, I think. Uh, this is an excerpt about Apollo 8 from the Discovery Channel series, When We Left Earth, the NASA mission. With just four months to prepare, Apollo 8 will be the first manned flight to leave Earth orbit for deep space. And he said, uh, we're thinking about changing the mission of Apollo 8 and going to the moon. Do you want to do it? Four months is not a long time to change a mission. A lot of things happened on Apollo 8 that were, you know, unplanned. Since this was the uh, first flight on the Saturn V, first flight to the moon, first of a lot of things. It was uh, a pretty risky flight. shaking was unbelievable. The vibration was so intense you couldn't see the instrument panel. And the thrust looks good. All engines, all sources show the stage is burning perfectly. The third stage fires twice. First, the boost into orbit. The second burn takes the crew of Apollo 8 where no men have ever been, deep space. There was no way that the Earth's gravity could hold us back any longer. So we were on our way. We could see the Earth, and we could actually see the Earth shrink. It was quite a sensation. Apollo 8 is shooting blindly for the moon. Computers calculate their trajectory. If the numbers are off by even a little, they'll either crash into the lunar surface or miss the moon completely and just keep going. Houston, one minute to LOS, all systems go. 
This was one of the more exciting parts of the flight because we knew that if we lost radio communication when we were masked by the moon, when we were supposed to on the flight plan, we were exactly on trajectory. Uh, there's your noise. Command reset. Tape recorder forward low bit rate. And at the exact millisecond we were supposed to lose the radio, we lost it. You stop to think, going 240,000 miles and then aiming for a point 60 miles above a surface, but I think we came out within a mile and a half of where we were supposed to be. For the first time in human history, men look upon the far side of the moon with their own eyes. They're just 70 miles away. Well, it was on, a, I don't know, sixth or seventh or eighth revolution we looked up. And that's when, when we came into sunlight, we were all totally amazed by the earth rise. A beautiful sight. It's tiny out there, it's inconsequential. It was ironic that we had uh, come to study the moon and was really discovering the Earth. And God bless all of you, all of you on the good Earth. Still amazing. It's still, the crew of Apollo 8 captured the world's attention. And as you heard, they are here today. Frank Borman served as commander, also a veteran of uh, Gemini 7 space orbital rendezvous with Gemini 6, that was in 1965. James Lovell served as command module pilot and navigator. At one time, Lovell held the record for the time in space. And William Anders served as the lunar module pilot. He took the famous photograph of the Earth rising over the moon's horizon. Thank you very much for joining us, gentlemen. We're delighted to have you here. And why don't you greet him as well? That was great. That's our museum audience, and I would like the studio audience to be prepared to ask questions as we go throughout this program. I want to hear your questions as well. I have a bunch of them here that I've been, since I've been doing some research, and gentlemen, thank you very much. Frank, let me start with you, if I may. In September, I, if, if my research is correct, it was in September of 1968, the unmanned Russian, uh, what was that, uh, Zon 5? Zon, Zon 5, uh, made an orbit of the moon. Did this affect your mission? I'm not certain whether it affected our mission or not. I, I was told that the CIA had intelligence that uh, they, they were, Russians were going to try to put a man around it before the end of the year. And uh, that was the reason for the change in our mission. Because after all, the Apollo program was just a battle in the Cold War. That's what it was fundamentally, a battle in the Cold War. Boy, you hammered, it, you hammered the, uh, the whole theme of my, my series of questions here. Oh, but, I'm sorry. No, that, that's great. <laughs> that's you want to start over? No, all, all, all I have to do is shut up, point. <laughs> and you want to shut up? The, uh, James, what was the original mission? Uh, how did it change? The original mission actually uh, was an Earth orbital mission uh, to test the... Uh, a command module again and the lunar module uh, for the first time and to make sure that both of them would work before we had committed them to the moon and we'd also do a high-speed re-entry uh, 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 just like we would come back from the moon to test out the re-entry procedure of this super circular type of re-entry uh, and of course uh, when uh, Apollo 7 went 11 days was successful and we had some idea that, that uh, Frank mentioned that the uh, Russians were going to put a man around the moon, uh, and the lunar module was not ready by 1968. Then a very bold decision on the part of NASA management uh, decided to take Apollo 8 around the moon. Well, bold it was. Uh, 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 Bill, the, what would you think the odds of success for this bold mission? Did you, did you calculate that at all? Well, frankly, uh, I thought... Uh, we had about a one chance in three of having a successful mission. Another one chance in three of having a mission like Apollo 13 where they made it back but weren't able to accomplish the landing. And then maybe a one chance in three of not making it back. Well, that's pretty chilling. Those aren't very good odds, are they? Well, you, you keep in mind, as Frank said, uh, this was not a program to explore the moon or develop uh, technology. It was a program to demonstrate mm -hmm. to the world and to ourselves that American te technology was preeminent and that we could beat the Soviets in that regard. 
And that's where the new Saturn rocket came into this mix? Saturn rocket was necessary in order to do this. The, uh, of course, there were, one thinks and one believes and one has been told that the NASA always been very fastidious about testing before sending any humans out on these kinds of missions. What were their, were their concerns about using the new Saturn after just such limited testing? Let me ask you first. I, I didn't have any concern with that. One of the, each astronaut had a special. They might happen to be boosters. So I spent a lot of time at Huntsville and helped to, de to develop the crew escape system and so on. And the, the people at Huntsville were confident that they had been able to correct the difficulties that were experienced on the first two Saturn V flights. There had been two unmanned flights before. And the, the second one was almost a disaster. But uh, they, they... What happened? I didn't remember. Well, they had an engine shut down. They had a, an enormous pogo. The, uh, an 18-inch beam was uh, vibrating over a foot. It was a, a real disaster. But uh, they, they convinced the NASA management, and I was convinced that they, they knew how to solve it, and they did. Going back to that film we just saw there, uh, Jim, you were obviously the first uh, men to both leave the Earth's gravitation and see the dark side of the moon. You were the first ones to ever do that. Th that, that precise timing, what concerns did you have at the time before you went on that mission? Well, Nick, I really didn't have much concern. I, I was sort of happy that that decision was made. And I agree with Frank that uh, I didn't have any uh, apprehensions about the Saturn V. I, uh, since Apollo 7 went around the Earth for 11 days, I thought going to the moon would be a, a natural follow-on. Uh, and, uh, you know, we were three explorers doing something entirely different. We were going the entire distance, 240,000 miles, and we're going to see the far side of the moon, which we never see the far side, of course, from the Earth. And so I was quite excited about it. Uh, it was, though, in the morning when we got to the top of the gantry, and my two companions went into the spacecraft first. It was still dark out. And the press car started to come and man the station. And I looked at him, and I looked down at the ground, and I said, these people are really serious. <laughs> 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 this is not another Earth orbital flight. <laughs> this is going to the moon. And that maybe was the time when I said, well, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> I guess you all said, here we go. I want to get to that picture. Uh, uh, Bill, you were talking about this before. In, the, uh, in that film we just saw, uh, that the, the Earth rising above the horizon of the moon, uh, we saw two pictures there, I believe, of that shot. Which one was yours, or were they both yours? Well, first of all, I'd like to say that if Frank had told me about this vibration, I'm not sure I'd have gone. <laughs> <laughs> first I heard about it. The pogo. But I, did have, I did have my blanket and some th <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it's my understanding that the, uh, the first shot was the Apollo 11 Earthrise, mm -hmm. and that the still picture was the Apollo 8 Earthrise. It must have lent itself to some grand thoughts when you saw that, the Earth uh, rising above the horizon of the moon. Well, what struck me, I mean, I think we were all uh, you know, taken aback because there had been no planning discussion of seeing the Earth. Uh, we were trained uh, to a degree to explore the moon, to comment on the topography and geology, if you will, of the moon. And when I saw the Earth rise, and then also pictures of the small Earth from a lunar distance, it crossed my mind that, you know, here we'd spent all this time studying the moon, and what we were doing was discovering the Earth. Wow. Uh, tagging on to that then, taking it to the next step, which one of you, or did you do this together, decide, decided to read from Genesis? Well, the Genesis reading, about six weeks before the flight, I got a call from Julian Scher, who was the head of the uh, uh, PIO for uh, NASA, and his widow is here today somewhere. I saw her. There she is right there. And, and if you can imagine this, Julian said, hey, Frank, uh, you're going to have the largest TV audience that's ever listened to a man on, on that broadcast from the moon on Christmas Eve. And I said, gee, that's nice, Julian. Uh, what should we do? He said, anything that's appropriate. 
I, I, you know, right there, that, that was the essence of this country. We, if we'd have been Soviets, we'd have been talking about Lenin or this or that. And I got the instructions to tell the crew to just do what's appropriate. And so I, I uh, frankly, I think we were all really busy with the flight plan. That was the last thing on my mind. I don't know about you guys, but, but I contacted a friend of mine, Cyborg, and, and uh, about two weeks before the flight, he came back with the idea of maybe reading from Genesis. And uh, we all liked it, and uh, that's how it happened. Uh, uh, almost ad hoc, but so appropriate. Well, just as one of the ones who was back here watching, uh, may I tell you that that was one of the most moving experiences of the entire, entire NASA program, and that is saying a lot. That's a considerable thing to say. Let, let me explain a little bit more of what Frank was talking about, because Cyborg Ian was trying to think up something to say that was appropriate, which was Genesis, of course, but he, he went to a newspaper man, Joe Layton, mm -hmm. and said, look, if you write articles all the time, <laughs> wrote right prose, what would be appropriate for the Apollo 8 <coughs> crew to say? And so Joe Layton spent up most of the night trying to figure out what would be appropriate around the moon on Christmas Eve to say to millions of people uh, all around the earth. And finally, his wife came down and she said, what are you doing? And he told her what his project was. And she said, well, it's natural read the first 10 verses of Genesis, which is the foundation of most of the world's religions, not just the Christian religion, but most of the people who will be listening to you are probably not Christian. And that's how it finally came to pass. Well, she should get a plaque somewhere on this. I think she should. <laughs> and thank heaven she didn't say, yes, Virginia, there is a Santa Claus. <laughs> <laughs> what a great and Somebody else said that. Though. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Uh, to, uh, to take it back to uh, a moment none of us likes to remember, uh, that is, uh, what was it, January of 67, a training mission with your fellow astronauts uh, ended in disaster. Uh, did the press coverage, as you recall, change after, uh, let me ask you this, Bill, uh, did it seem to change after Apollo 1? I frankly uh, don't know. Maybe these other guys do, but uh, it's my recollection that the uh, scrutiny of NASA from Congress and others certainly increased. And uh, frankly, I think if uh, they hadn't assigned Frank the job of rooting out and then saying without any frosting on it uh, just what happened, uh, we wouldn't have gone when we did. And the spacecraft they the re-engineered uh, almost from the bottom up wouldn't have been anywhere near as good as it was. So maybe Frank would be the guy. Talk to me about that investigation. Well, the, the Bill is awfully kind, but the genius behind the Apollo 8 mission as well as the re-engineered uh, Apollo was a, a man by the name of George Lowe, who unfortunately uh, passed away with a brain, brain tumor, I think, didn't he? Melanoma. Yeah, melanoma. Mm -hmm. But uh, he changed the whole management concept, and he, he became much more disciplined. You couldn't get any change in the spacecraft unless he approved it. and, and uh, the, uh, the difference between the Block 1 spacecraft, which is the one that burned, and the Block 2 spacecraft, which is the one that flew successfully, but there wasn't a, a problem in any of the missions with the command module ever. Uh, so it was uh, a tribute to George Lowe and the people that he put together that, that made that work. Actually, one of my big disappointments on our flight was I was the sort of the command module systems engineer, and I was just hoping for one of the multi- uh, emergencies that they gave us in the simulator that I was so skillful at solving. <laughs> but Frank made this thing so good that he didn't have anything to do but hang on and take a picture. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't get to show off. Huh? We didn't have a lunar module. <laughs> it was a lunar module pilot. <laughs> well, it is amazing, though. I think I read somewhere that uh, there were so many different systems and parts in the Saturn-Apollo combination that if you had a 99.99% su success ratio on all of them, you'd still have, what was it, 5,000 failures. To the best of my knowledge, we didn't have any significant failure. And, and this that. was in the analog days where yeah, yeah. they didn't have digital chips. Yeah. I think, you know, probably some of the, one of these watches today you wear had bigger capacity than the Apollo computer. <laughs> That's right. That's right. That's, you know, I really need to take our viewers uh, back, for, for those who are uh, very young particularly, 
uh, take them back to that, that time, to 1968. I, I always called, I was doing news even then, and uh, I always called it the year the United States had its nervous breakdown. Nothing seemed to go well in 1968. Everything terrible that could happen did happen. Martin Luther King, Jr., Robert Kennedy, the uh, Democratic National, uh, all, everything that could mess up seemed to mess up. And at, at the, however, at the end of the year, you three and all of those who worked with you and supported you made it all come right. Out of all those things that happened that year, you were the Time Magazine People of the Year. Uh, did you have any sense of how important you were to us at that troubled time? Let me ask you, Jim. At the time that we were doing the mission, uh, at least for me, uh, I was so in involved in trying to do a good job and getting back safely that I didn't realize the importance of it until after we got back home again. And then I looked back at uh, what had happened all during 1968 and the fact we were successful. Uh, and I thought that uh, this is really our highest moment right here. And we ended the year uh, on an upbeat. Boy, did you ever. And could we ever use it? And we really needed it. I know this audience is too young to remember. <laughs> <laughs> we, maybe not all of you. <laughs> But at, at, least, really at least the stock market was stable. <laughs> <laughs> uh, excuse me, uh, a stock market? What's that? <laughs> <laughs> Down there. Yes, mm. that's right. We're, I think we're entering the post-stock market era, aren't we? <laughs> the, the, uh, at that point, did that help? Or what was the relationship of NASA, and particularly uh, the face of NASA, you, uh, with the press at that time? Uh, let me uh, ask you, Frank. Well, I, I think for by, by and large, it was very favorable. Uh, it was hard to get bad press after Apollo 8. Yeah. After the fire, it was hard to get good press. Gotcha. So it's just like the media always is. They, you know, it goes up and down. Yeah. And when you got a weak sister, they pile on. Mm -hmm. When you have a success, they pile on. Who was the darling of the press? Who was the, uh, who was the, uh, the one well, that they always looked well, to? After the flight, hmm? Jim Lovell and I had to get back to work. But Frank, Frank flitted all around the globe. Wow. <laughs> yeah, he, was our, he was our spokesman. I oh see, my. yes, I see. Okay, well, so, so you were the darling of the press, huh? No, I, I wasn't yes. the darling of the press. Yeah, I thought you meant who was the, I guess Walter Cronkite was yeah. kind of the. I, I thought it was uh, that, the press yeah. people. I thought he yeah, was the. Yeah. Uh, oh, of the press. Yeah. Yes. Probably well. the most knowledgeable was Jules Bergman. He knew, he knew it backwards and forwards. Everybody knows Walter Cronkite. Maybe not as many people will remember Jules Bergman, no, but he was very he smart. Too, yeah. Yeah. He was a smart fellow. Uh, I spoke to Walter four days ago. Uh, yeah. Told him I was going to be talking to you. He said to say hello. He's still alive. Huh? Yes, it just, <laughs> just he, he said the same about you, Frank. <laughs> <laughs> well, I talked a moment ago on the telephone to Cy Borgen, who, and. Good. I said, Cy, how can you still be alive? He said, well, I am 95, and he's still Jesus. going to ground. Holy, so. I think, I think uh, Walter's 92, I believe. Is he really? Uh -huh. I think he's 92. But it, it, the, uh, the, the, was there this, this sense of competition? We've seen it in the movies, uh, and we've heard about it in, in books, and, uh, and, in, and some pundits say it. Uh, was there a sense of competition among the astronauts themselves? Uh, let me ask you, Bill. Well, um, we were all hoping to get a flight, and uh, particularly when you're down near the bottom of the totem pole like I was, junior guy, uh, you were careful not to put your foot in it. And uh, so there was some quiet competition, but uh, I think in general people were more cooperative than they were competitive. Now, I must tell you that one thing that Frank won't admit is that uh, the question about who was the first around the moon and I claim that I was flying the spacecraft, gave it a little left yaw, so I went around the moon first. <laughs> not that that was competitive. Uh, <laughs> not competitive at all, are they? No. <laughs> Anybody want to dispute that, Jim? And I took the picture. <laughs> <laughs> this is a tough crowd. I don't know. Listen, I'd like to once again, uh, and as a matter of fact, this is the moment. Those of you with questions, if you would begin lining up at that microphone, we'd like to get you all set. We, I very much want to get your questions for this distinguished group up here. And uh, if some of you I know out there uh, have some personal relationship uh, with the 
uh, with, with this great trio. And if you have some, uh, some behind-the-scenes information, we'll be thrilled to hear it. In the meantime, up to a point. <laughs> while, they're coming, <laughs> while they're coming up to get ready to do that, let me ask you this question, and let me start with you, Frank, on this one. I'd like this, I'd like this from all three of you. What's the future of space exploration, and what should it be in your mind, Frank? Well, it looks like the future now would be going back to the moon. And uh, from my standpoint, that seems appropriate. Uh, the humans going to Mars, I think the difficulty there has been, uh, has been uh, underestimated. So it, it seems to me before you learn, can really, really run, which would be a trip to Mars, I, I, I'm in accord with what they're trying to do. I don't know what they're going to do with the space station, but I hope they find a use for it. Are you in, uh, <laughs> on the same page there, Jim? I, I kind of agree that I think that we have to have a very uh, constructive space program because not only uh, it's not the ending of getting someplace, either to the moon or to Mars, it's the technology that's developed in the process of getting there, whether we're successful or not or whether we ever get to Mars or not. The technology that we develop spills over into the private sector as it did in the early days of the space program. And for that, I think that uh, a program, uh, a, a government program like NASA, I think is uh, very important because it touches on all of us, it touches on all parts of the country, and it's a creative program. It also generates taxes, both individual and corporate, that flow back into the government again. So, so we get a lot uh, for our dollar in uh, uh, supporting uh, space activities. And uh, you are, you're in agreement with Frank about what that uh, what the immediate future of the space exploration should be. Is that right? Yeah, the moon. Yeah. I think I, I think it's necessary because we still have to develop the the newer technology that we used in the past. What we used was archaic now. What we have now in hand, we should all go back there and see how well we can function to go into that place first because we know we've been there. So uh, we want to continue that and then figure out whether we can go someplace else. Bill, would you go along with this? Do you, do you agree? I agree with the uh, lunar aspect. I think we should look at uh, re revisiting the moon more, is a lot less like we look at going to uh, at McMurdo Base in the Antarctic Station. I don't agree that, uh, that the program vis-a-vis -vis tech uh, the technology is a reason for doing it. It's very expensive to put man in space. And we have to, NASA and the public needs to keep in mind that we didn't go to the moon for Teflon frying pans or lunar rocks. Mm -hmm. We went to the moon to beat the dirty commies. <laughs> and uh, that's what Frank said. I mean, that's it. You need to tell NASA that. Well, I have, you know. But uh, <laughs> NASA sometimes is in the aerospace industry has become a jobs program. There's a lot more jobs out of a big shuttle in the space station than there are in some of the unmanned vehicles. Do you have any ideas what should happen to the space station? Well, I, th I don't know. I, Frank put it uh, very succinctly. It would be nice if they could find a good use for it. Uh, and uh, I think uh, that's been hard to come by. But, but you know, uh, you really, we should give credit to the people that have built the shuttle and are flying the shuttle. Enormously complicated, difficult tasks with all the EVAs and everything, and, and really not much in the public eye. I, so I, I have a, a real high regard for the people that are involved in the shuttle program. Yeah, me, me too. Yeah. But if you're talking about uh, uh, getting pub you, NASA had public support because of the Cold War. And when the flag went in, the support dwindled. And so I think it's important to have the political support in order to fund these things. And there just isn't that kind of support for a lot of what uh, is really running up the bill these days. So when the Berlin Wall went down, uh, your, your, the support for NASA started to dry up? When the flag went in, well before the wall went down. Mm -hmm. That's right. When Apollo 11 landed, the uh, competition, the challenge, disappeared. Right. And uh, so what, oh, you're, I see what, you mean. what you're talking yeah. about now is, do we go on to develop technology or, to, or develop, some, and, and uh, Bill says, well, sometimes we ought to look at it. And he has some factors because the unmanned program, the Hubble telescope, a well, that's fantastic a, that's a program, uh, uh, success. Mm -hmm. Perhaps we learned more about the universe in the last 30 years than we have in the last 300. Well, the, the Hubble telescope is really a manned program. It can't operate without shuttle support. And mm -hmm. the space station requires shuttle support. And so uh, there's a lot of real unmanned programs that have been shoved over the side because they haven't got the funding for them. I think that's too bad. 
I think we ought to have a manned program. I think it ought to go back to the moon. But to expect it to have the support that Apollo had for the same reason, I think, it just doesn't work. And I, I think it's almost ludicrous to be talking about going to Mars as Americans racing the Chinese. We ought to go back to Mars or those places as human beings from a planet that can somehow work out its problems. Working it together. Yeah. I see. That's they not have to probably. Don't you really agree? It'd be so expensive. That's probably the only way to live around. Yeah, and in the radiation environment, I think, has been massively I'm at a cooperative program. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's check these questions. Who's this? Hi, I'm, I'm Ellen Ingalls. I'm from Connecticut, and it's really an honor to be here as somebody who is uh, really in awe of the astronauts and wanted to be one in the 60s, and I was inspired to a 34-year career as an engineer by the science involved in the astronauts. My question is, did you have any downtime as you were uh, waiting to orbit the Earth during the flight, enough time to play cards, have camaraderie. Um, what kind of um, behind-the-scenes fun time did you have together? If you'd worked for Frank Borman, then you'd know there was the answer to that. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're, you're, getting, you're getting a lot of heat today, you know. But, he, <laughs> but yeah, because but I he got snapped the whip, he made it successful. I got sick and threw up all over the <laughs> other one. We were going to bring that up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, bring it up. Yeah. Bring it up. <laughs> that was, that was one up. more thing than we needed to know. <laughs> 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 Uh, did any uh, was was there any card playing? Uh, anybody who brought the dice? You know <laughs> what, what happened there? No, actually, I think we were pretty busy most of the time, either navigating or experiments. Uh, yeah. If you ask that about Frank and I on Gemini Seven, we uh, <laughs> we each brought a book along, reading, <laughs> reading a book and writing logs. But that was a two-week affair. Yeah, they each read it twice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Who's next? Hello, I'm Frank Sarisi and I'm from Arlington, Virginia. And my question is really prompted by what I think two of the three of you said earlier, which was relating uh, your mission to the Cold War. And I started thinking about that. And my question is this, did you three at the time ever meet any of the cosmonauts and uh, develop any kind of a relationship with them? And was there any sense of competition um, in a personal matter, not a Cold War in a matter, between the astronauts and the cosmonauts during the 60s and early 70s. Frank, why don't you start that one off? I had not met any of them before Apollo 8. No, at that time, uh, they were still very secretive, and we, we didn't know what they were doing. I didn't know the names of anybody except Yuri Gagarin and, and a few of the early people that you know, came out in, in publicity. But uh, uh, we knew very little of what they're doing. I might have met them uh, when I was chasing Russian bombers uh, over Iceland <laughs> in my fighter. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, they made the Tom Cruise gesture. Yes, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> but uh, I met, I met uh, all of them, a lot of them, later in various capacities. And uh, one of them in particular was Alexei Leonov who uh, claimed, and I'd have any reason to doubt, was the uh, cosmonaut selected to fly on the flight that the Russians didn't approve that would have beat us around the moon. He was very unhappy that they didn't let him go. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Nice. Good questions. Should have had you do it sitting up in this chair. Go ahead. Hi, I'm Robin Grugan Capper. And uh, my dad went to school with you, Colonel Borman, and you and your wife stayed at my parents in Peru for a couple of weeks when you were there. I have a question about the photographs that you took from, I don't know, it was 8 or 11. I see them all the time. The Earth Rise is the most beautiful photo I've ever seen, and I believe you took it. We, I also have a couple of photos of the coast of Peru that were taken from one of the Apollos. Do any know. of you recall taking them? Did you all take photographs? L Anders took all the pictures. And Frank wouldn't let me look out of the window <laughs> during orbit. <laughs> <laughs> that is the truth. We were too busy. We only spent an orbit and a half. Uh, I think I got one shot of San Diego, my hometown, and he wasn't looking. But uh, our pictures were all post-injection uh, towards the moon. Mm -hmm. the, Peru, the Peru pictures probably came from Gemini, don't you imagine? You signed them, so I <laughs> we had it. <laughs> uh, 
you know, we had photography inside uh, mm -hmm. through the camera, but uh, but that's about it. Okay, there were you. great pictures and a great question. Thank you very and, and uh, a, a, a reattachment to somebody you yeah, knew a long right. time ago. Right. Hmm? That's great. Step right up. This is great. Hi, I'm Deidre Adams. I was at the Apollo 8 launch. It was fabulous. I really enjoyed it. But uh, when I went home to watch you circle the moon, I was convinced that you were going to encounter an alien outpost and be captured. Did that thought ever cross any of your minds? <laughs> Mm -hmm. Wow, here we go again. <laughs> Back to Roswell. <laughs> well, actually, we did the flight at uh, Area 51 at uh -huh. Roswell. So. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, there's been a lot of talk about UFOs and so on. And on Gemma and, and our flight on Gemini 7, while we were doing IR tracks on the bush that put us there, I refer to it as a bogey. And the, there was a magazine back then called True Magazine. Mm -hmm. And they wrote an article saying that we were in a control of the government. We'd really seen a UFO, which is all pure yes, baloney. Sir, absolutely. Baloney. Absolutely. And uh, cool. ever since then, I get letters about I'm lying because I've seen a UFO. I've never seen a UFO. I don't think there are UFOs. And uh, I don't know. I have to ask you. Uh, we, Young we lady, there are no UFOs. <laughs> <laughs> there is nothing. Uh, is, you know, going around the earth looking at us. <coughs> uh, now there is probably intelligent life in the universe, yeah. uh, in other galaxies or other stars or something like that. We'd be very naive to think that we were the only intelligent people in the universe. But as far as little green men visiting us, don't worry about it. <laughs> we, we've all been sworn to say that. <laughs> That's what I you know you're a troublemaker. <laughs> That's what. <laughs> <laughs> At the pain of death. <laughs> There's one in every crowd. You know? <laughs> All right. Yeah. Um, hi, my name is um, Daniel Ackward, and I'm from um, Laurel, Maryland. And I'm a really big space enthusiast. My question is, what problems d happened on Apollo 8? Let's find out. Uh, did we have any problems on Apollo 8 that you had to yes, work I'll, around? Yes, I'll mention one. <laughs> Uh, because it's, uh, it's kind of interesting. It's my fault, by the way. I'll start out right from the uh, beginning. Mm -hmm. That's why he's mentioning it. Yeah. Because <laughs> <laughs> he knew we would if he didn't. <laughs> we know a couple I, others, I was yeah. the navigator on Apollo 8, and my job was to make sure that the gyros were properly aligned at all times with respect to the celestial sphere. And I did that through the computer and the guidance system. And there was a program that I could put into the computer that uh, would then... I could select stars, and the spacecraft would then automatically drive up, and the optics would then go look at the star, and I could look through the little telescope, and if the star wasn't directly on, in the center of the crosshairs, but off a little bit, I could move it, center it, push a button, it would take the time and the three angles. And that's how we aligned the platform all the time to make sure we knew our attitude. I got to be very good at it. I was almost like a concert pianist playing a Steinway. <laughs> and on the way home, the people on the ground still wanted more and more information to see how well this system was working. So one time in my haste to do this, I put the wrong program in. Instead of telling about aligning the platform, I told the computer that we are back at the launch pad before the flight, <laughs> and the rocket was still <coughs> vertical. <laughs> and uh, and we're all waiting for the launch, and of course the whole guidance system went back to Cape Canaveral. <laughs> oh, uh, the aircraft went. The, the, the eight ball went all sorts of ways, uh, and uh, we lost complete uh, uh, knowledge of our attitude. Fortunately, we did have a backup system, which required me to go to the window, look out. <laughs> And <laughs> saying, is that really regulus up there? <laughs> and then manning driving a spacecraft around and trying to get that little telescope in there to take a, take a sighting on that star. But fortunately, the training we had uh, prevailed, and we were able to get the alignment back again. But there's always a uh, you know, silver lining, because on 13, we had to shut off that thing, and so we had to do it on purpose. And so with that previous training, really helped me. Yeah, I was flying the spacecraft at the time. I think Frank was sleeping, and suddenly the ball started moving, and I thought we'd had a stuck thruster. So I went to correct it, and so now the spacecraft was moving. So Frank came up out of the 
sleep station, you know, and I won't tell you what he was saying. But, uh, <laughs> you'd think he was a Navy man, not an Army man. <laughs> and, and this was like not very many hours before reentry. So it was... This is touchy. Yeah. Is, uh, but I'm glad Jim got his practice for Apollo 13. <laughs> that, was, it was, that wasn't easy either. I, I couldn't have done it. Jim did a great job realigning the thing, because it, trying to find, trying to identify a particular star when you don't have a wide range of vision is pretty tough. So what did you have to say to him about the little, little tiny little mistake he had made? Before. Please don't do that again. <laughs> <laughs> that was nice of you. Yeah, please. The FCC will penalize the network. Yes, you. <laughs> That's yes sir. Did, did that answer your question? Yeah. I'm glad you asked it. Did you have another one? Go ahead. Um, yeah. Um, and uh, then this TV series, From the Earth to the Moon, um, the engine went out. Did that actually happen? Um, did you almost get stuck in lunar orbit? I, I don't know. If, the, if the engine had gone out, would we have been stuck in orbit? Yes, we would be. We'd I mean, like, did the engine almost go out, or did it, everything go smooth in it orbit? It worked as fine as far as we knew. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> We're you, here. Did you? Uh, <laughs> you've been told to say that. I see. Right. <laughs> My body Thank double. Thank you. Thank you very much. Another young man stepping up to the microphone right now. These, these folks are good. Yeah. They know what they're Hi, my name is... My, my name is Brian Ackward. I'm from Laurel, Maryland. And my question is, well, I'm a space enthusiast, too. And what? my question is, what's, what was your most memorable, par memorable bar part about the flight? Most memorable part about uh, Apollo 8 or any? Uh, uh, yes. Apollo 8, about Apollo 8. The most memorable moment, the, most, the, the thing that you think about most now if you think about Apollo 8. Let me start with you, Bill. Well, the... Seeing the Earth, the, the Earth rise picture is certainly a memorable part, and it's been picked up by the press, and it helped kickstart the environmental movement. And Al Gore used that picture yes. in Inconvenient Truth. I think that was right after he thought he took it, right after he invented the Internet. <laughs> oh, oh, tough, tough. Wait a minute. But the most memorable thing for me was to see the Earth about as big as your fist at arm's length and realize that if we'd been 10 lunar distances away, which is no going nowhere in space, now the Earth would be one-tenth that size. And the idea that the Earth uh, is so tiny, you know, almost trivial as you know, on the physical scale of things, uh, I don't think that's sunk in in general to humanity. I mean, I think a lot of people still think that uh, the whole system revolves around the Earth. And it doesn't. The Earth is, uh, you know, out in the left, f left field of a puny galaxy where there are, uh, you know, billions of them out there. And Jim had mentioned other things, other intelligence. I think that's got to be the case. Mm -hmm. And so to the degree we can get it across to ourselves that, you know, that we're not quite as important as we thought, I think it would help. But on the other hand, this is our home planet, you know, and we need to take care of it. Moment. Yeah, my most memorable moment was when I looked out the window and saw water splashing on the thing, knowing that we had <laughs> safely landed in <laughs> the Pacific. <laughs> <laughs> How about you, Frank? Seeing the Earth come over the Seeing lunar horizon, Earth, I think that, that well, all three of us agree that, that was, was it. That's, that's the one. These guys took a lot longer to say that, but was, that was it, seeing the picture <laughs> coming up. Wait coming. a minute, that's their gig, you know, that's oh, what they're doing. nothing else to say. Thank you. Did you have something else? <laughs> no, thank you very much. <laughs> Is he the big brother or the little brother? <laughs> Are you the big brother or the little brother? No, brother. <laughs> he didn't want to hear that question. Uh -huh. <laughs> I, I'm not related to them. So. Um, hi, my name is Drawyer of Lifker. I'm studying public policy right now at uh, Georgetown, and I was a school teacher before that. And I'm curious to know, kind of on a broader scale, um, who were the people that inspired you to do what you did? And as a second part to that, what kind of inspiration or leadership do you think you can give or you would like to give uh, to young people like the two questions we just had. Let's start with you, Jim. Well, I kind of think that the inspiration, I, and I hope that the, the uh, space program does this, is to give the young people a sense of accomplishment and that they would like to follow the footsteps, not so much being astronauts, but being in science or technology or, or make it a successful career. I am uh, associated with the Adler Planetarium, and our whole project there is to have young people come through and through seeing the various artifacts that they have and, this, and the uh, programs that we have, 
uh, gives them a sense of, uh, you know, that they want to accomplish something in their life. And so uh, that's what I hope we get out of our space activities. How about the, uh, your inspiration? Uh, I think that was one of his questions. My inspiration actually started uh, just beginning in high school. I, for some reason, had uh, started to, I, for, I was a Boy Scout, so I was interested in astronomy. And then I started to learn about rockets through a pioneer, American pioneer named Robert Goddard. Uh, read his books, wanted to become a rocket engineer, and towards the end of World War II, tells you how, how old I am, but anyway, we learned about uh, Von Braun and the V-2 rocket. Wanted to become a rocket engineer, wrote to the American Rocket Society, and they said that, uh, you know, best to take all sorts of science courses and either go to MIT or Caltech. I couldn't do either. But then I finally got into naval aviation. My uncle was a very early naval aviator, and he gave me the second inspiration, sort of a second goal. And I wrote my term paper on rockets at the Naval Academy. And then uh, as things happen, and this is something I like to tell all young people that you keep trying again because my interest in rockets and aviation met when I went and graduated from test pilot school and suddenly NASA needed astronauts. And uh, it, it was a natural. I just had to be in the right place at the right time with the right credentials. I didn't make it the first time, which is another thing that young people ought to think about. I was one of the first 32 of the original seven uh, but the other seven guys got in, and then I applied for the second time around, and I made it. So you've got to keep trying. If, uh, if you fail the first time, keep at it, and, uh, and you'll always succeed. Bill, did you have an inspiration, spe a specific one? Well, I, like Jim, uh, my high school uh, science teachers, biology teachers, uh, got me turned on to science and engineering, which I later followed even in the Air Force. But I think I have to give it to my dad, who was an uh, American naval officer uh, whose ship was sunk out in China, first uh, officer to order open fire on the Japanese in 1937. And so uh, defending the country, being in the military was just, I mean, I never questioned that I wouldn't go to one of the academies. And uh, I was lucky to do that, become a fighter pilot, and then NASA had this uh, curious combination of needing uh, people with technical backgrounds and fighter experience. And like Jim, I was in the right place at the right time and got into the third group. I'm absolutely shocked that Buck Rogers wasn't your inspiration. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Did you, uh, I think the other part of the question that we heard there a moment ago, if I, uh, maybe you'd restate it, that is, how do you feel uh, your, what can you do to inspire others? Well, we, our family has a little foundation, and one of the main things we support are uh, environmental and science education. And I think that uh, it's important to be well-rounded and know your Greek and Latin and English, but uh, you better know your geometry and your algebra and your physics uh, if you want to be an astronaut, but just if you want to be a functional citizen in this increasingly technological age. So I would encourage uh, young folks and old folks to, uh, to break out those kind of books and learn them. Uh, Frank. Well, I, for some reason, I don't, I'm almost like a disease. I started building model airplanes when I was quite young, and, and uh, even though we were very, very poor, my parents encouraged me, and if I, if I could pay for it, I took flying lessons when I was young. And, and as uh, Bill and Jim said, we were the, right behind the greatest generation, the one that world, and there was, a, I, I was sort of like I was born with an, an innate sense of patriotism. I think partly that was because of the war. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, the other part of your question I think is really a good one. I can't remember anybody coming around and saying, what do you want to be? Maybe you ought to be this man. I, it, I, I, it's almost as if we, we are now trying to, what should you say, coach people into doing something. I think Programming. people somehow have to find it within them, and then you can develop it. But to, trying to... Uh, to preach to kids, they'll go do this or go do that. I'm not sure it works. I mean, we may be doing too much of that, in my opinion. Yeah, the word you used, Bill, programming. You, you think there's too much programming of... I don't people? know. I'm not in education I'm not, I'm not either. I'm just telling what but I think. I think, think it, at least to have quality education available, not yeah. just in the, uh, the elite private schools, but in the public schools. Exactly. Yeah. 
uh, good science program. Uh, maybe not everybody takes it, at least everybody has a chance to take it. Mm -hmm. Good math. Uh, to get a, a, a technologically uh, literate uh, voting uh, mass in the country. You're a school teacher. Yes. How do you feel about that? Uh, well, have, I couldn't agree more. Target? I huh? couldn't agree. No, I just I think that um, that really the young people of today could use more role models like yourselves. Yeah. Uh, in all honesty, and the and teachers could use merit pay, in my view. I'm serious. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I, I would love that. <laughs> I would love that. Um, and uh, but I just I, all I would say uh, in response is simply uh, thank you very much for your for your views and for for your service. I really you know al along that line, I think one of the greatest privileges I've had is going to a wonderful public high school in Tucson, Arizona, a small little town. But what we were, people were, teachers were so dedicated and that just Bill, Bill said the opportunities were there. And yeah, uh, isn't it sad that the president-elect is thrashing around trying to decide whether his girls ought to go to a public or a private school? Isn't it too bad that the nation's capital doesn't have a decent public school system? And it doesn't. Mm -hmm. Thank, Thank you. you. Another question. Uh, good afternoon. My name is A.R. Hogan. I'm a science journalist, and I'm working on a doctoral dissertation at the University of Maryland about the history of television and radio space coverage. And I wanted to ask you about the impact of television news coverage in building public awareness, knowledge, and support for the space program. And as the Apollo program got more and more interesting, the Apollo 8 flight being a pivotal point, yet after Apollo 11, the coverage declined as the scientific exploration got more and more complex and, and challenging. I'm wondering what you think about if the coverage had continued, if the news media had really tried to build the public support more than, than it did, would, would the public support have been sustained? Frank? I'm not certain you, I'm not certain you can do that. I think that uh, when you set a goal, which was to get to the moon first, and then you achieve that goal, American people are wonderful. Yeah, they say, ho hum, what's next? <laughs> and I don't think that any amount of media coverage could have changed it. Now, I agree with Frank. Uh, uh, on Apollo 11, of course, everything was uh, Apollo 8, Apollo 11, uh, big coverage. On Apollo 13, in the beginning, before the takeoff, I think the only mention about Apollo 13 was on page 78 of the weather page at the New York Times. <laughs> uh, and, uh, you fix that when you blow up the oxygen <laughs> tank. Huh? That's a, well, that, that's the point, Frank, that I want to make. <laughs> <laughs> Everything was so complacent until the explosion occurred. And if you remember what my wife said when they called up and said, can we put a TV camera on, on your lawn after the explosion, she said, well, you weren't interested before the explosion. Why should you be interested now? <laughs> Good for her. I didn't remember that quote. That's great. <laughs> well, NASA gets, uh, uh, had gotten bad mouth and even still does about, you know, not doing more to bring it to the public. I mean, I thought they did a great job in trying. Uh, I thought the press, uh, you know, did a great job in rising to the occasion as they could, but it's really the viewership that really doesn't give much of a darn, you know, about the 15th Apollo landing, mm -hmm. you know, or what's happened in Baghdad lately. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we Are blow we up still a there? bunch, yes, uh, but right. it's Sarah Palin's dress, you know, that's mm -hmm. uh, big news these days, <laughs> or, bail or bailing out uh, GM. And so it's, you know, it's, it's us, uh, the, the, the viewership that really sets the pace. Well, as Pogo said, we have met the enemy and exactly. he is us. Yeah, so I, I think you know, hopefully in your doctoral uh, thesis you'll not only look out the, uh, the lens but look back and, and see who's watching. It's well, I, I certainly consider the beginning of the space age and the space exploration the biggest news story ever in any century, any time, and yeah. you gentlemen certainly were in incredibly important parts of, of that story. I, I know that uh, Frank Borman and Jim Lovell both had a chance after Apollo 8 to draw on their experiences from that flight and be guest experts on television news and, and network coverage of the space program. And I'm wondering if you have any recollections from, from those uh, chances that you had to, to be on network television explaining the space program during later missions, please. To be honest with you, it's kind of like today. We all, it really was very similar today, mm -hmm. except it was 40 years ago. <laughs> uh, and memory slip a little bit. <laughs> what, one phenomenon that I've found that's interesting is that an astronaut is assumed by many in the public to be an expert 
on almost anything. <laughs> and many of our colleagues will, you know, answer almost anything. <laughs> you know. uh, which colleagues would those I be, Bill? Uh, you know who I'm talking about. Some, some of them even see UFOs once in a while. <laughs> oh. oh, it's getting tough up here again. Wait a minute. Uh, it's a line of fire. Uh, did you have a further question? Uh, well, if you were advising the television networks now in terms of paying attention to space exploration to try to get them to, to give more heed to it, how would you encourage them to do that? Because it's almost invisible on network even news. We're having a space shuttle launch Friday night. It's, We've it's just concluded be. the Mars a poor lander mission this week, and most of the public doesn't probably even realize those if, things. If you're a cynic like me, the news is to be able to show a commercial now and then. And in order to have a paying commercial, you have to have people watching. So it's got to be soap opera, okay? I'm sad to say. It's got to be an exploding uh, Apollo 13 or a space shuttle or a beautiful Hubbard, Hubble picture. But the workaday stuff, you know, with an a I bet hardly anybody watches the NASA channel. And it's pretty interesting if you watch it. Well, I hope you're wrong. Well, I hope I am too, but I'll bet I'm not. <laughs> Bill, we're on Just NASA. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's my point. Well, so far you've blown up news, you've blown up NASA, you've blown up the audience. Is there anybody else you can offend? I think here? it's important that we don't. I think it's important that we don't start enjoying our own bathwater. And there's been a lot of that. Sorry. <laughs> You guys, it was a long six water. days. <laughs> <laughs> you understand our problem now. <laughs> okay. The, uh, I suppose uh, one of the questions that I'd like to ask has to do with, with this event. And what I mean by that is uh, you all were together for a very intense six days, a very, and, and other times, for a very long period of time. You can't believe After. when Frank got sick how intense it was. <laughs> <laughs> that was very intense. Uh, I think our perception is that once you have uh, been sort of conjoined in that kind of an effort, that you are probably, uh, you, you probably stay in touch all the time, that you're, uh, you talk to each other once a month or you visit or you have a reunion. Is that true or is it not? Well, I think we remain very good friends. We don't stay in touch. We have reunions. We're going to have one in San Diego here next, next month. Uh, but, uh, you know, I had absolute confidence and these two gentlemen sitting here, trusted my life to them. When you do that, when you feel that way about they remain friends forever. Uh, that's just, it's, uh, it's a unique experience. Uh, it doesn't mean I go around, uh, we don't see each other every day, and Anderson sometimes a pain in the ass, but. <laughs> <laughs> but I, didn't, I didn't notice that. But I mean, I didn't notice that, no. But I, me, but, what a surprise. I, 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 I just can't think of any two people I would have rather flown with or how, and I had more confidence in who came through. That was as good a mission, as perfect a mission as ever been flown because of these guys. Well, I'd say that uh, because of Frank's leadership, I mean, yeah. it, uh, quite frankly. And another factor is... Wait a minute. I You're going to turn nice all of a sudden? <laughs> I'm, I'm basically nice. I just don't want it to go to his head. <laughs> but I think another factor is I think we're the only crew who are still married to our same wives. <laughs> and the wives, the wives keep in touch probably we, more than we, we do. We had some genetic similarity. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, let's see now. That's, uh, that takes care of the rest of the astronauts. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I think you have to remember that, that Frank and I were on a two-week mission together. Yeah. And when we got down on the aircraft carrier after two weeks, Frank said, uh, please be informed we're engaged. <laughs> <laughs> Who said that? <laughs> he said it. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody said it. What do you think and about it? I didn't dare ask. <laughs> <laughs> or tell.